Tech. Well, Michigan Tech is a very special school. It was a great education, but I wasn't a very good student. But I've never been. I barely got through high school, and then I didn't make it at all at uh, uh, University of Illinois. I flunked out the first year. But then I went up to Michigan Tech, and it was the right thing. It was a Michigan School of Mines when my dad went there, and my uncle too. So then I started to blossom, and I, I learned a lot. I was into mining and geology in addition to uh, mechanical engineering. So my degree is mechanical engineering, but I was minoring in mining and mining geology because I was planning to go on to get an advanced degree there. And Dad said, uh, you know, you can do that in another few years. Why don't you come to work for me for a period of time, and then you can go back to college if you want. And so I went to work for him, and I started doing some really interesting cutter designs, and I was pretty good with geometry. So I was doing some pretty original stuff, and my dad was a mining engineer and a really sort of a rough, tough sort of a guy, bigger than I am, fantastic athlete, and uh, a really good scholar. So he, some of the professors that uh, I went through at Michigan Tech uh, had passed him with flying colors and they said, you know, you're gonna have to shape up or you're out of here. <laughs> so. He was a tough uh, act to follow. He was a tough act to follow for everybody. Was it hard to work for him? Yeah, no, it, it, uh, you know, I had uh, worked on uh, vacation periods, but uh, I'd only worked with him full time for about three months. And uh, we just had a marvelous time. Uh, yeah, mom died when I was quite young, and so he just was a bachelor the rest of his life. And uh, were you close then? Did that bring very you close? close. Yeah. yeah, very close. He he was very foresighted, and he would come up with marvelous technical solutions and he was a great salesman so he would have customers that uh, the machine is struggling it's not really working they're not getting anywhere and he would able he would be able to talk them into uh, oh you know just a couple hundred thousand more and we'll be able to make this thing <laughs> work you know and so uh, I don't know how he did it but uh, he kept things going even when things were terrible and the machines weren't working. Uh, there was a big group of these small machines. He built uh, uh, four different small tunneling machines, all of which one after another failed to operate because the, the cutting system was not able to cut the rock. And so that's when he realized the problem is uh, that the, uh, the cutters just aren't going to make it with drag picks. So you've got to get rid of the drag picks. So, you know, maybe we should try with drag picks and disc cutters, but then get rid of the drag picks and just see if the disc cutters work by themselves. And they work like a dream. The whole machine went ahead faster than uh, it was with the with the picks. He gave me a job to work on cutters, cutter uh, arrangements and developments, and I had the right geometry in mind. Uh, we were completely, uh, most of the ones that, that I was working on wouldn't have worked very well either, but at least the geometry was right. But uh, anyway, it, his uh, guidance was uh, uh, what got me enthusiastic and then dad was killed three months later and uh, so uh, I ended up at 25 years old uh, taking over the little company it was like 17 people he was flying back from Denver on a business job and and uh, we kind of expected him to come in uh, the next day and uh, he didn't and uh, uh, well, his body and his airplane was discovered, 
I think it was seven months later. And my uh, banker uh, and lawyer came to me and said, look, we gotta make a payment, we gotta make a payroll, we've got bills to pay. Dad was the only one with the, uh, an account that, that had a signature. And so uh, we went down to the, the banker and, and uh, kept our staff going and uh, uh, finishing, we had to finish a tunneling machine, then we had to uh, put it into service on the Oahe Dam, the, the uh, fourth Oahe Dam machine. And uh, our field service guys, three of them I think they were, went off and made the machine uh, work and uh, the rest all got laid off. And uh, so that's, that's what happened for nearly a year. Yeah. And then we got that uh, Tasmanian contract. And uh, so it was just, there was a lot of luck. What sort of developments do you think will have significant impact? A plain vanilla, really hard rock right. with good hard rock cutters is something that we've been able to do now for some years and our competitors can all do it too. But when you combine that with a really overstressed rock, the rock is destroying itself. When you make a hole in it, it wants to close it up, but it, it's explosive. And so now, if you've got a tunnel, like we had this, this one job in, uh, down in Peru, in the Olmos project, uh, they just were lucky that we ever finished it. The big rock burst. I mean, there were people that were injured. Uh, lots of, it happened over and over again. So uh, we were very fortunate when the last time the machine got just crushed, uh, the, we repaired it, uh, it took about three months, and then we started uh, going ahead and the rock began to uh, become less stressed and we're able to finish the tunnel uh, about a year later. So we, it, you come to the conclusion that you better, when you go into a job like that, you had better have a spare machine and then enough cash to start making the third one when the first one fails and now you're on your spare, you know, because the, the, the ground was destroying us. And uh, so this was really exciting because I think we have the possibility to combine uh, uh, tunneling machines for overstressed rock like that in a way that can keep the ground under control and then use a yielding support system. And our company is very, very, very careful not to have uh, any collaboration that would compromise what our customers expect. You now, for years and years, we would make proposals custom design machine for a particular job and we'd have three different customers with three different designs uh, uh, completely giving us uh, the idea that this is the, what we think the, the geology is like so this is the kind of machine we think we ought to have what do you think about that well we could build that kind of machine but it should have this and that feature so we'll make a custom design machine for a particular project and then a different uh, customer will ask us to do a different thing. Right. And we've uh, been very careful not to share any information, not only with the different uh, customers, the, the, the contractors, but also, of course, not with any of our competitors because uh, business is business. But if you had to go back to do it over again, would you do it this, would you still pick this industry? Have you enjoyed it? Oh yeah, your... I, I've found it uh, 
very uh, demanding and uh, very uh, risky, extremely risky. Uh, for quite a number of years, we'd go for a period of seven or eight years where we don't really bring in much because what we do earn, we spend on R&D work. And so uh, that sort of business, occasionally we're really good at coming up with a new product. And then we make a whole bunch of money for a period of five or six years and then the competitors are all on it. And, and uh, so that uh, doesn't last very long. So you've got to find something good. But if you go through a period of 10 years without, or eight years or something like that, well, like we did, uh, where we don't have the uh, direct com competition, but a real advantage for our customers, uh, then we can make a little money. Uh, that job, we fought for two years to get the job and then we lost it to Hitachi Zozen. But they decided that we had features that they needed. And so we sold, we're selling our cutters to them. So we've now uh, still have a little tiny piece of that job, which uh, is pretty exciting. You said you're innovating, but you're slowing down. Do you oh, get yeah. these you know, moments where you see the vision? Yeah, well, I feel one of my uh, talents or, or strengths is to sense what's going on in the rock and in the ground. And the machine has to uh, be part of, it's causing the hole, so <laughs> making the hole. And so the machine and the ground have to be working together. And uh, I can sort of sense when things aren't, aren't working right. You know, you can analyze all this stuff with uh, structural analysis and finite element analysis and all kinds of things of that nature. And uh, if you do that as a academic person, uh, you often don't get the right answer, even though you've analyzed it all the way, uh, because it isn't just the analysis of that structural problem. It it's something you need to have a sense of the geology, even if it's soft ground, but uh, you know, uh, you're working with the soil or with the rock. And uh, especially when it's mixed in uh, mixed conditions in, in one face, that makes it uh, something that you have to be able to sense what the machine is facing to make this happen. Do you still go in every day to work? I do get in from time to time, and uh, we spend some time talking about cutters still. But um, I, uh, I'm really completely retired, and but I've got so many other things that I'm anxious to do that I haven't yet done. Like? Well, I mean all kinds of things. Uh, you know. Uh, hobbies, I would say, fly fishing, uh, sailing. I'm now rowing uh, in uh, uh, a competitive rowing team. And uh, usually I'm the oldest guy there because uh, in two months I'll be 80. But, uh, it, uh, but anyway, I'm staying fit. And, and Life is good. Yeah, it is.